um, with that, let's go ahead and get started and talk about uh, since September of 2018, there's been a lot of advancements in our understanding, um, thanks to you and to some other research groups in understanding type one narcolepsy with cataplexy and, um, and you know, more about the genetics and some of the environmental factors. So can you give us an update? Yes, I think now it's more and more clear that uh, the cause of narcolepsy type one is really this autoimmune process where the immune system gets triggered by the flu and starts to attack certain pieces of the flu that resemble uh, hypocretin or rexin, which is a chemical in the brain that helps to stay awake. And when the immune system starts to confuse you know, the flu and this cells that produce hypocretin, they destroy them. And once you don't have hypocretin, this is the cause of type one narcolepsy. And, and uh, that's a relatively simple. Well, you make it sound simple, my goodness. Um, where, for the environmental factors, do you think it's just flu or could it be other things? Ah, uh, so I, we don't know. Probably flu is a big one, but strep also has been suggested, strep, to, uh, strep throat. And I still believe that it's involved as well, that you know, if you have the flu and strep on top of it, it makes it worse. Whether or not we'll discover some other, other things that could cause it or trigger the immune response, it's always possible because nature is very diverse. So there must be a lot of different bugs or virus that may have sequence that could look a little bit like apocretin. Um, so of course, you're going to ask me if coronavirus is going to, <laughs> to uh, trigger narcolepsy, is that right? Well, I, at some point, yes, I was going to ask <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yes. we. Actually, someone from the CDC asked me that question, and it's difficult to be sure, uh, but probably not, because I think we would have noticed it before, but um, it's not possible to really be sure that it, it could not have a sequence inside that would resemble the apocretin. Because one of the things we've discovered actually very recently is that it's quite difficult to figure out based on the sequence you know, just looking at the sequence of the flu, peptides, and, and the apocretin, what really resembles hypocretin. Uh, we don't have a good model. So it's more in, in three-dimensional space that it needs to resemble. And it's not very easy to make a model to see what really resembles hypocretin. Um, so it's okay. always possible that there will be something in the coronavirus that resembles hypocretin, but uh, probably not. Can you explain that little piece a little bit um, over again for me? So the uh, flu has a piece of it that mimics, or no, not mimic. it looks like a hypocretin cell? Yes. So exactly. What happened is uh, there's a little piece of the flu that looks a little bit like apocretin in its sequence and its structure. So that when the, the immune systems, the immune cells, that are recognizing the, the virus, they take the virus, they kind of shoo it up in small little pieces, and then they recognize specific pieces. And one of these pieces looks like apocretin. So it starts to attack the virus, recognizing this piece with special receptor. And then at one point, we don't exactly know why, there is some apocretin floating around close by, and it starts to recognize the apocretin, and then it gets more and more directed towards hypocretin. And then it starts to think that the hypocretin is just a flu. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, it attacks the cells that produce hypocretin, like if they were flu infected cells. And then at the end, they are all dead and you have narcolepsy. And um, why is it certain people that that happens to? Ah. So there are probably many different explanations. One of them is genetic, uh, because the way our genetic system uh, reacts to flu infections or to infection in general is very personalized. And it's very useful because otherwise, if a new flu was coming about, or like the coronavirus, for example, we don't know why some people are very sick and others are totally fine. In fact, we know, of course, that if you're old and you have a lot of comorbidity, you have a lot more chance of, of, of having a very severe coronavirus. But there are even kids that, so, that sometimes die from the coronavirus or young adults. 
and almost surely it's their genetic uh, because everyone has a slightly different genetic uh, makeup that makes them able to direct uh, immune reaction or against different pieces of the coronavirus. And that makes us better able to fight the coronavirus if it mutates in different areas, because this way we're not all attacking the same piece of the coronavirus. And that's a little bit the same for the flu and narcolepsy. There is some people that attack more a certain piece of the flu and others that attack other pieces of the flu. And that depends on certain of their gene, in particular ones that's called HLA, which some of you that are nerds like me, you know, <laughs> know about it. There is a, a gene called HLA that predisposes to narcolepsy. And this HLA gene has like many, many different variants. And there's only one particular variant that predisposes to narcolepsy. That's called DQB10602 that 25% of the population has. And you need to have this particular variant because this particular variant is sees a piece of the peptide of the flu that looks like, like uh, hypocretin. If you don't have this particular piece of HLA subtype, which about 25% of the population has, you are going to, to, to bind other pieces of the virus that don't look like hypocretin. So that's why at least the genetic play a big, big role and I'm sure for coronavirus, we're going to discover the same thing, that the people who are very sick probably have certain HLA subtype, for example. And maybe we'll also discover that maybe some people who have, after coronavirus will have strange complication, you know, autoimmune disease. That's very possible, uh, depending on their genetic makeup. So definitely some is genes. There are also genes that are very important with how we react to the flu. We have even found certain genes that patients with narcolepsy have more than controls that process a little bit differently the flu or uh, make the immune cell more reactive to the flu. And all this makes you more susceptible to narcolepsy. And in addition to the genetic, we know that there's just bad luck uh, that happen because many people get the flu and many people have the genetic makeup and only a very small percent get narcolepsy. And the bad luck is at least partially due to probably the type of infection you have had in the past because your immune system learns every year. Every time you get a new flu, it, it just learns this new flu and it kind of uh, adapts itself over the years. So the state of your immune system depends on what you have experienced as infection since you have been born. And that's why actually even twins that have exactly the same genetic, if you really look at the immune system after 15 years, it's quite different. Uh, so there's definitely your past, you know, past uh, history of infections that also makes you more or less susceptible to narcolepsy. So that's why actually we even have hope that one day we might even be able to maybe vaccinate people to prevent them from developing narcolepsy because we might be able to make the immune system go in a certain direction against the flu that will avoid them to develop this immune reaction that is confusing the flu with hypocretin. When is that coming? Ah, <laughs> ah that's a good question. So I think we could try now. The problem is, uh, you know, narcolepsy is not that common and people are always a bit afraid of tankering with nature a little bit, you know? Uh, so is that worth it to, to do it? Um, Considering that there are so few people who, who develop narcolepsy, it's very difficult. You could, you, you never know. By pushing the, the reaction uh, towards not narcolepsy, maybe you could create another problem. You can never be absolutely sure. I don't think so. And I think eventually when we'll know more, it will be done. Uh, but let's say that right now, I think we need to do a little more research before, before doing this. I think yeah. where it could be very helpful is, for example, Julie, uh, you know, in your brothers or sisters or, you know, people who are family members because they have more chance of developing narcolepsy. We know that it's not a huge risk. It's only about 1% if it's a brother or sister or a child. Uh, so it's not like something to be worried about, but 1% is not negligible. So for these people, I think it could be worth it to develop a special vaccine or something that would that you could give them when they're young and will avoid maybe them to ever develop narcolepsy. But and what, uh, and 
people that have the DB, I'll get it wrong, but the genetic marker, but that's still a quarter of all people, right? That have yes. that. So I think, uh, yeah, even in patients who have, so the, the chance of developing narcolepsy in the general population is about one for two to 3,000 people. If you are DQB1 or 602 positive, it's about one for 800 people, okay? Still low, okay? But if you add all the genes, we're actually now doing that. If you add all the genetic predisposition, you could tell actually exactly what chance everyone has to develop narcolepsy. But still at the end, I think we still would come up with, oh, you know, even if you, I take your genetic makeup, I would probably say, oh, Julie has one for 200 chance of developing narcolepsy. I would never say, be able to say from the genetic, Julie, that's it. You have, you are going to develop narcolepsy. But when you go to one for 200 or one for 100, like family members or people who have a high genetic loading, uh, it might be worth it to consider a vaccine slightly different and would prevent the development of narcolepsy. But I think it will take a long time before this is, uh, you know, done. Unfortunately, I wish that things will move faster, but I think you have heard all the, all the discussion about how complicated it is to introduce a new vaccine. And of course, all of you know that there were one particular vaccine that even triggered narcolepsy. So it's always a risk benefit ratio to try something new. Um, so you, there still needs to be stuff to figure out about the genetics and about the immunology, right? Ex so, like, exactly. Oh, okay. And then- Because you're right. If, if we get, if we somehow are able to really understand this process completely, you know, we might even be able to see which one are highly at risk because for example, there may be some people who already have the cells that are ready to be activated by the virus and could be then, uh, you know, killing hypocretin neurons. Maybe these people is only 1% out of 10 of narcoleptics. And then those, we might, it might be really worth it to prevent it. So if we could discover the exact cells in the blood that are dangerous, we might be able to find a way to avoid them to be ever activated. So, you know, this is a fun and also the frustration of research. You know, we are, it's a little bit like you're trying to narrow down and narrow down and narrow down until you, you really get to the final answer. And I think we still have to learn about the immunology to be able to really predict who is going to develop narcolepsy. But it might be possible that one day we'll be able to take a blood sample and say, oh, this person is really at very high risk because they already have the cells that are dangerous. And those maybe we could use a vaccine to prevent it. I just think it's so fascinating. Um, Dr. Mignot and I had, had a, a phone call a few weeks ago that sparked my idea to do this um, broadcast because uh, Dr. Mignot actually recommended a book to me about five years ago, I think when we were in Australia, um, uh -huh. called The Great, the Great Influenza. And um, so I'd, I'd read that five years ago, not realizing, you know, of course, um, how it would be so um, relevant. You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I remember the specific chapter and I went back and looked at it again, um, how after the uh, 1918 flu, um, people, it took a while too. It wasn't always immediate, but there was um, Parkinson's uh, like symptoms. And there was even an interesting form of schizophrenia um, that some people, you know, developed. Um, and so, you know, this kind of this idea, I think our society hasn't quite caught up to understanding how flus and influenzas and um, that immu immune systems interaction with the brain and, and um, neuroscience. Sorry, that's my, I'm the lay person, but I just no, think no, it's- No, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I want to, to say one thing about that is, what is the most complicated organ in the body is the brain, right? I mean, we know it's super complicated. But actually, the immune system is as complicated because every minute, you know, we have, I mean, if you ever take a Petri dish and of course I, if you spit on it, I don't advise you to do it, but a lot of things will grow pretty disgusting, you know, Staphylococcus and all, oh, you know, it's beautiful. But even if you take like the surface of your skin, we have five more, I, you have heard that your microbiome, we have five more bacteria that, that we have human cells. So we, it's an enormous amount of bacteria and virus that are always in constant synergy with you. And of course, 
it's 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 I'm sorry to say, but I still believe in natural selection. <laughs> it's kind of natural selection in action every second. So the day you are dead, these things you you I mean I'm sorry, but you you just start to rot from the inside because the bacteria just are not enough kept, you know, by the immune system. So we are constantly fighting even our own bacteria that are friends of us. We still tell them, you know, just don't go too much, you know. So the immune system is more kind of a general equilibrium. And sometimes we get this completely new, uh, you know, um, new flu or new bacteria. But it's incredibly complex. It's really our, our whole interaction with the outside. And I think it's estimated that there is a, about 10% of all the genes in the body that have a role in the immune system. It's, it's absolutely huge. So we are discovering that more and more disease are going to be related to infections and in ways that we did not understand. And for a long time, people have believed that the brain was immunoprivileged. You know, this is a story of mankind as well. I mean, if you read a lot of history book, you know, we didn't, the men, or we thought that we were in the center of the universe. You know, of course, where, you know, so the earth is in the center. And then we discover we run around the sun and we are like a little nothing. Then after, you know, we probably saw that we were, Europe was a, the only center of the universe because, you know, and of course that's not true. And then after we believe that we were, you know, different from all animals and we realized that we're the same as all animals. And then we discovered that we have a very different conscience and we're different from animals, but now we are realizing that animals have very complex behaviors and they, I think, I'm sure that animals have, uh, you know, some animals can, there were one, one paper recently just came out that suggested that certain monkeys already have all the instruments for, for language. So it's clear that the more you realize, the more we, we see that we are not different from, from animals. And I lost my train of thought, but I think the, the whole point was that uh, we are really in harmony with, with the rest of the, of the universe. We are just a little piece. So you were you were saying that um, that we thought that the brain was um, oh yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It's the same way. Of course, the brain is considered the gold organ. You know, my God, the brain that's that's us. You know, but actually, I think we are really underestimating a lot what the peripheral body can 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 do. And I wouldn't be surprised, for example, if you when you when we measure proteins or um, even gene expression in different parts of the body, like the liver you can actually find many, like about 10% to 30% of the gene or protein in the liver, they change with sleep. So it's like if the liver was sleeping himself. So I think we, we definitely overestimate probably a little bit our brain. And the second thing is we have always kind of looked at it like it's immune privilege, that the immune system didn't go there, but it was, it was all in the protected because it was so important because we're so unique and now we realize that it's not very different from other organ that cells of the immune system go into the brain and they make sure that the brain is not infected like the rest of the organs so right. the same way they can be subjected to autoimmune disease like narcolepsy but it's a relatively new concept i mean this was really uh not believed to be true uh even 10 years ago uh so now there is a lot more interest in understanding how the immune system works in the brain and many people is believed in many many more diseases than just narcolepsy right uh and schizophrenia and parkinson exactly yeah and i've seen with um covid19 that there have been some neurological you know they're starting to even report already on some neurological symptoms and yeah, stroke um can you answer for me i, I a little, can you tell us a little bit more um, about what happened in 2009 and 2010? So you alluded to a vaccine causing narcolepsy, but can you go over just briefly like what happened with the H1N1 flu? Yes. So I, I think that's good because maybe I can teach a few of our the listeners about the, the differences between the coronavirus and the uh, flu. So you know, genetic material comes in two flavors, you know, DNA and RNA generally, and DNA is what we have in our cells. And RNA, a lot of viruses have RNA and instead of their DNA. You know, RNA is something we produce in our body to, to produce protein, but it's not our, gen, our 
genetic materials that we use to translate to make babies, you know? We use really DNA as our core genetic material. And uh, the virus, like both the coronavirus and the uh, uh, flu, are RNA virus, which are actually more common than DNA virus. And one of the issues with RNA virus is that they have to be transformed into DNA to be reproduced inside the cell because a virus is like a parasite. What it does is really inject its genetic material and try to use as much as possible of our own uh, cellular machinery to reproduce. So it can't reproduce by itself. So in fact, a virus is at the border between being alive or not. You know, what a lot of people ask what, what it is. Is a virus a living organism or not? In theory, it's not a living organism because it cannot reproduce by itself. A bacteria is life because, you know, it can reproduce by itself. You give it nutrient and it reproduces by itself. But the virus, it can, it has to have a host and it's going to use the host machinery to reproduce itself. And when it's an RNA virus, it needs first to be transformed in DNA. And as a consequence, one problem is it mutates a lot because it makes a lot of errors when it does that. So the RNA virus are a little more dangerous because they mutate more, they change over time more, which is good and bad because at the same time, the coronavirus, like the flu, is going to evolve probably to be more uh, happy with humans, you know? And it's not the advantage of a virus to kill everyone because it rather like makes them sick and go to the next person. Because if you kill everybody, you know, it's not good for natural selection. The natural selection is not going to function. It will immediately die and the virus will disappear. That's why Ebola, which is so bad, has, has never been like a huge epidemic because it's too lethal. Uh, but, so, but right now we have a new virus that at the same time can reproduce a lot and is also quite dangerous. Can you, and it, and yeah. Can you describe about the H, the H one N one and what happened, and how? So the difference, so the slight difference between the flu and the uh, coronavirus also, is I mean it's technical, but that the the flu is in some ways more dangerous because it has what we call a segmented genome. That means that uh, the chromosome of the of the flu, there are several chromosomes. Instead of being just one piece of DNA, it's several pieces of DNA. And as a consequence, sometimes it, it kind of um, get mixed up with another flu from another species, usually swine or bird. And then it reassort its chromosome. And suddenly you have a very, very uh, mixed virus that's half bird or half swine and half human. And then this one goes through the population and that's a new virus. Uh, that can be very dangerous. This kind of, we, we call this, uh, uh, this animal flu that suddenly go into human, it happens once every 50 years. And when it happened, it can be really horrible. So you mentioned the 1918 flu, uh, it killed about 100 million people. So that was really awful. Uh, and, and I think we can learn a lot from, from this to apply to coronavirus. Then there were another flu like that in 1957, it probably killed about 200,000 people. So that was a lot of people as well. So there were a flu called the Hong Kong flu uh, in uh, 2000, in 1968. And interestingly, so until 2009, the flu that were circulating was a descendant of these flu that came from animals that had adjusted to human. So that, you know, every year you get just almost the same flu that just has this new mutation and you just need a vaccination that change a tiny bit and you are relatively protected already because you have already seen the flu. But then when this new flu happened and in 2009, there were another ones that came out of a swine, uh, it can be very dangerous because you, you may not have any immunity and the virus is much more nasty as I explained because it has not adjusted to the host with all this new mutation. And that's what happened in 2009 and we had already suspected that narcolepsy had something to do with the flu or strep throat because we had noticed that in young kids that develop narcolepsy, very often they had upper airway infections or strep throat, and then they develop narcolepsy during the summer. Uh, so in, in kids, the narcolepsy is very often very abrupt. In, in older adults, sometimes it starts over a period of a year, so it's a little hard to say when it started. 
But in kids, it can be very, very abrupt. Suddenly someone developed narcolepsy, sometime within a week, you know, the, the child was completely fine, he's seven years old and suddenly falls asleep all the time and gained a lot of weight. And the parents sometimes can tell you, oh, this started the week of March 15, you know, there's no doubt he was totally fine before. And when we plotted when narcolepsy started in these young ch children, it was always starting during the spring and the summer. So that with the strep and so forth, we already suspected that some infection during the summer were triggering narcolepsy. But then when you had this new flu that happened in 2009, the swine flu, people panicked exactly like coronavirus, except that, thank God, it was not as bad as coronavirus. But it started in May in uh, Mexico, you know, and initially people thought it was going to be as bad as the coronavirus because uh, people, uh, you know, the, what we call the case fatality rate, the number of people that come sick at the, in the hospital and that need really and die was about 0.6%. For coronavirus, it's about 1.2%, so it's higher, but it was still very high. But that was overestimated, clearly, because there were probably a lot of people that had it that never had symptoms. Uh, and But still, people really thought, my God, this new flu is going to be like 1918. And that's why they pushed this particular vac vaccine very, very quickly. And unlike coronavirus, it, it's, it's a little bit better because the flu, we already create a flu vaccine every year with these old strains that circulate. So creating a flu virus with a new strain, it, it's not that hard. It's a little bit like plugging in the, the same process with a different flu. So they really hurried the va vaccine at very fast. You know, from May, they could get it in December uh, because they were very afraid of the following winter. But then there's one particular company that made a particular flu that we don't really understand, flu vaccine in Europe called Pandemrix, and you've heard of it. So it was, I believe, probably a bit too strong and very special. And I think we actually found maybe, I, we have an idea of maybe why it was uh, particularly bad. I think one of the ways of the protein of the virus were extracted maybe created more of a problem. And it, it kind of seems to have triggered a lot of cases in Europe. But the virus itself also increased the number of cases. So clearly it was just a virus that sometimes was confused with hypocretin, but uh, with a vaccine that maybe was a bit stronger and the composition a bit different, this effect was even magnified. So a lot of people developed narcolepsy after the, this particular vaccine only in, the, in Europe. So of course, now we are a little bit in the same situation. So now, since 2009, every year you are getting vaccinated, I hope, because I'm totally pro-vaccine, because the flu still kills, you know, 25 to 50,000 people every year, especially old people. And um, you are being vaccinated with a descendant of this H1N1 swine flu. Uh, you know, there's just a tiny bit of changes that are accumulated in the last years, you know, since uh, 10 years, sorry, uh, you know, so they grow in eggs or descendant to be as close as possible of what circulates now, but it's very similar to what it is. And it's also descendant, second strain that is put in is the Hong Kong flu, which is from, 19, I told you, in 1957, that's still circulating, that's called H3N2. And then you get also another influenza B, but that's not very important. So that every year, that's what you get as a kind of a booster. And so, everyone is waiting for a new pandemic that will happen sooner or later, the flu. Sometimes people are terrorized, especially about the bird flu, because the bird flu has never really passed into human. Uh, but if you get a bird flu, usually you can get sick of the bird flu, but uh, and you have 50% mortality. So it's terrible. However, you cannot pass it to another human. You know, for that, you would need to probably be infected at the same time with a human flu for this kind of recombination to occur. And this has never happened, but people are very worried. In fact, uh, certain agency like BARDA have spent a lot of money to try to make sure that if this ever happened, we'd be ready to create a vaccine against a, a new flu like that. Um, of course, nobody expected the coronavirus. Right. Everyone expected the flu. So, and I can tell you more about the coronavirus if you want to. Well, I, so we won't know when another flu, I mean, I understand better from what you've just said that the swine flu from 2009 was this new 
you know, thing. Yes. Um, we won't know, I now guess, whether Corona or any of the bird flu, if any of those are going to cause an upsurge in narcolepsy until we're able to do that 3D modeling yes. you mentioned earlier. You're right. You're right. And, and but in general, you know, it has more chance to be a flu because a flu looks like a flu. <laughs> and we know that the flu is, is resembling certain pieces of the flu are resembling, uh, you know, hypocretin. So probability is that a piece of coronavirus would resemble like apocretin is much lower. Um, um, what about the but, um, strep throat? Does strep throat look like the hypocretin? Uh, the problem is the difference between the flu and strep is a bit the difference between a lizard and a human. Uh, a bacteria is a million times more complex than a virus. Oh. So to give you an example, the, the, the virus, uh, like the flu, has only, I think, 13 proteins, 13 different proteins, because it uses, it just has a minimum needed to reproduce itself and to use the machinery of the cells. Coronavirus is actually more complicated. It's a single genome. Uh, it's a 30 KB, only one chromosome. So it doesn't have that problem of, of jumping species the same way. It can jump species, but as a block, and then recombine with other species. Like this one comes from a bat. It's almost you know, nine, very similar to a bat. And it has a little piece that some crazy people say was fabricated in the lab. But when you look at the sequence, it's actually very similar to the sequence in Pangolin. So most pe reasonable people, I think, would agree that probably it's a bat that infected the pangolin, that reinfected the bat, that infected the human, something like that. Uh, but um, well, I, I, I went like in well, a completely different dis <laughs> direction. I'm I sorry. Was, I hope it's interesting to you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, we have so many different things. So let's just um, maybe. But it's possible that the coronavirus will produce narcolepsy, but unlikely. But what I think is always possible is that there will be a piece of the coronavirus that will look like something else in the body and that it will maybe create another autoimmune disease or also complications that we don't know. So that's always possible. Yeah. And maybe we'll never really know. Um, and before, um, oh, well, I guess while we're on this topic, I, I remember you mentioned that you have been working um, possibly, I think, was it on vaccine and vaccine side effects? Have you been helping with any of that as far as COVID-19? Yeah, so what we do in narcolepsy is actually very applicable to coronavirus. I mean, the, it's, I, I still focus on the flu itself because I'm a narcolepsy specialist and I want to solve your problems. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but, but everything I'm learning about the different pieces of the virus and how they interact with the immune system to produce these reactions, I think is absolutely 100% applicable to the coronavirus because I'm the forefront of understanding this and, you know, it, it, it's pretty much the same problem. Um, I mean, in fact, it wouldn't be very difficult for me technically to do similar studies with the coronavirus, trying to understand how the coronavirus is recognized by different people. Uh, it's just that, uh, I mean, I'm more focusing on narcolepsy, but knowledge is, is, is always transferable. So, I, as you said, I mean, that's why people are a little worried about creating this coronavirus very quickly, vaccine. First, we really, it's, it's very mysterious, you know, the immune system. For example, the bird flu, if you try to create a vaccine, it's very, very difficult because you inject the bird flu and people don't develop immunity. We don't really know why. Why you, you have to put a strong adjuvant and similarly with the coronavirus, you never know. I mean, every virus is different and it may behave differently. There is even cases where a vaccine can produce a worse disease. Like I'm sure you have heard that dengue, dengue fever, there have been a vaccine against dengue fever that was developed and some which is transmitted by mosquitoes. And some people were vaccinated. It produced, the immune system became more active so you would think it's good, but actually it was bad because in some ways it produced an overactivation that actually killed people. So sometimes you, you really have to be cautious because you never really know what you're doing with a vaccine. So I think what right now is very hard because there is this need to understand the side effects of vaccines that are going to be different in every case, even within flu, between flu, 
between coronavirus and the, and then uh, at the same time, there is an urgency. I mean, everyone is very scared that the winter will come. And since usually these things are seasonal, that it will become worse. And uh, we, it would be good to be ready. So it depends how much risk you want to take. And in some ways, I think it's what I'm hoping is that people re will realize a little bit better. People expect things to be perfect, but unfortunately, I, I always say, you know, is unfortunately, we always take little risk. If you take an antibiotics, if you take anything, there's always a risk attached to it. There's no free lunch in biology. If you have something active, it always can produce a side effect. I mean, we so just have to make sure. And it's so difficult, like for narcolepsy, the side effect of the swine flu vaccine uh, produced by GSK uh, in, uh, you know, in 2009, it was only one for 16,000 children. So it's not a huge number, but you cannot test a vaccine in 16,000 people to try to see if nothing happened. So it's very difficult. I think we definitely need to phase more carefully how we, you know, and it was six months later too, that most of these cases uh, developed uh, narcolepsy. So imagine now we start with a coronavirus. If we start to vaccinate millions of people, we won't know before six months and maybe there could be something even worse than narcolepsy. So it's, a, it's I, I have to tell you, I'm, some people must not sleep very well when they lose this kind of decision. Uh, even myself, when I first discovered the association between the flu vaccine and narcolepsy, I didn't sleep for days because I was kind of convinced and I wanted to warn people. But in these cases, if you warn people, but you're wrong, oh my God, this is the end. I mean, can you imagine you have very few data. There is some cases that have been reported. You think it's true, but you know, you can be wrong because the data is not good enough. But if you say something and it's wrong, your carrier is destroyed. People will say, my God, you're an anti-vaccinator, you know, anti-vaxxer, you should be killed. And if you say nothing, people could come back to you. What? You said, you said nothing, but you already knew, blah, 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 blah. So it's extremely difficult to take this decision in time of crisis like that. Right. Sorry, I wanted to make a pitch for all the hard people that work so hard and have this decision to take, you know? Of course. I just, I just feel, I think there's just a sense from the narcolepsy community and from myself personally, even though I didn't get the, I already had narcolepsy at that point, of not letting the knowledge that has been gained through the experience in 2009 and 2010 go to waste. Um, so how, yes. how can we make sure that um, whatever has been learned or you guys are still working on, are you able to communicate with the people that are working on vaccines or be part of that process at all? Yes, I have a, I have a, the good news is I have some good friends at the CDC or people I've worked with and I think they trust me and they talk to me and I discuss with them and, and I, I, I just give my opinion and I think they consult me. So I think that's the good news. So bad news is they still don't give me any funding to do research, but that's a different issue. Um, I, I think, I think people are still, I've learned a little bit about this. They will be, I think, more cautious. But the problem is sometimes you can't be cautious. If, if it turned out to be so bad, you really have to weight the benefit risk ratio. So it's a, it is a very hard decision. But I do believe that uh, the big problem we have is a problem of uh, being very short-sighted. You know, like for example, the coronavirus, we had SARS, we had MERS, I mean, so these were two outbreaks of coronavirus that happened before. There were definitely some warning. And I know people who submitted grants to try to develop, you know, learn how to develop vaccines for coronavirus that were rejected, you know, by NIH, I don't know how many times, you know, and it's just absurd because you wait until you have a crisis and then you put billions and billions of dollars, whereas it, it right now, I mean, you can, you can study if sleep interact with a vaccine, you know? Like if you're sleep deprived or if you go more in the sun, I'm sure you can get funding to see if the vaccine is more effic efficacious because they are just pouring tons of money at the last minute on things that don't make sense, really. Yeah. I'm sorry we to say. Very, yeah, we're very reactive as a society. Ex exactly. And, and, and that's a really, I think 
for research, it's so important to go on the long haul. I, I think my story with narcolepsy is I've worked for 30 years on narcolepsy. And you know, there's no shortcut. Sometimes you just get some things that makes you move very quickly. Sometimes you just have to just dig a hole. And it's already hard to dig, but then if no one is helping you, <laughs> it's even harder. Yes, yeah. well, we'll get that in two ways, because I'd say that narcolepsy advocacy is similar. There's no magic cure to, you know, advancing it. It's a lot of little steps. And we're also using our advocacy to try to make sure that um, more narcolepsy and sleep disorder research is getting funded. So more on yeah. that in a little bit.